welcome. Thank you for choosing to listen to another Destiny Changing Word by David Entry from one of our Revival Seeking Youth Services. If you want to control your world, catch the word. Be blessed. So God made us to be his reflection. God created us to be his counterpart, um, to be his enlargement. God created us to be his habitation and he created us to be his counterpart. And reflection, enlargement, habitation, and counterpart. Last week, I didn't finish the counterpart. Last week, I quoted Isaiah chapter 54, verse 5. It says that for your maker is your husband. This is what God said concerning Israel. That Israel, I'm your maker and I'm your husband. Your maker is your husband. But why would God see himself as a husband to not one woman? Not one person. But a people. There. Your maker is your husband. The, The Lord of hosts is his name. And your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. So, okay, let's go back to that. Isaiah 62, I'm sorry. It says that for as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God. Talking about, is it, so it says your sons marry you. Okay, uh, so shall your sons marry. Sons. So it's not talking about one person. He's talking about a community. He's talking to Israel. And he says that God will rejoice over you as a groom rejoices over a bride. So he's trying to say that there is a bride and a groom relationship between God and his people. It was, it's, not, it's not just New Testament. It's, it is as old as God's agenda for creation. That's why in the Old Testament, it kept showing up. There's marriage union between God and his people. Between God, God is one and his people are many. Between God and his people. Between God and his people. That has always been his plan. Um, Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 11. Um, Then the Lord said to me, backsliding Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Let's go to verse 14. Verse 14. Return, O backslidden children, says the Lord, for I am, oh wow, I'm married to you. I'll take you, one from a city and two from a family, and I'll bring you to Zion. So God said, return to me, for I am married to you. Jeremiah 31, 32. It says that, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the days that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says who? Who broke the covenant? Who broke the covenant? From the, from the, from the text we read, they, not a him, not a she, they, so God is married to a they. He okay. says, so look at this, he says that though I was a husband to them, I was a husband to them. What am I try, driving at? That from, gen, from the beginning, God has seen, the scriptures have depicted a husband, wife, relationship between God and his people. So as long as marriage exists, it remains, it it keeps that understanding or uh, idea, that imagery of God and his people, it keeps it amongst men. So that as long as, for, for, for instance, if God says that I'm married to you, you don't know what marriage is. God said, I'll marry these people. 
What is marriage? Well, what is marriage? Is it when a cat jumps over the wall? What is it when, if you don't know marriage is, you would miss God's eternal purpose. So then, for his own interest, listen to this very carefully. Last week I spoke about it. Right? When he said it's not good for man to be alone. Yeah. Meanwhile, you made man in your image. Mm-hmm. So he created man in his image. It's not good for man to be alone. I'll make him a help me. And then when the man found the woman, he said, this is a bone of my bone flesh. He said, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined. Hmm. It's getting interesting. I'll show you something. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and uh, join to his wife and they, and they shall become one flesh. After man said, I found her. I found her. I found her. I found her. Then Jesus comes on the scene, as I told you last week, quotes that same scripture. But this is what is interesting. Colossians, sorry, Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. He said, I rejoice in my afflictions for you. Now I, I now rejoice in my afflictions for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church for the sake of his body, which is the church. Now, what I think, what I need is verse 23. Pardon me. Let's go to the verse 23. Yeah. Um, uh, Okay, I think, let's go to 24 again. For the sake of his body, which is the church. Now, go to the next verse. Of which I became a minister according to the, yeah, that's the one I'm looking for. According to the stewardship of God, which was given to me for you, to do what? You remember those of you who were around to have the privilege to hear me explain this text. To fulfill the word of God. Other translations. Do you have any of the translations that use to complete the word of God? To fulfill the word of God. To, uh, one translation uses to complete. Another translation used to um, give us the English standard version and then New American standard version. To make, the, to make the word of God fully known. This is very interesting. So people can actually know uh, uh, amplified. How does the amplifier put it? Entrusted to me for, for your sake so that I might make the word of God fully known amongst you. Now, I, as I taught the other time, the Greek word translated make uh, fully known is complete. That's why King James uses fulfill. I don't know what NIV uses. Uh, does NIV also use fulfill? Uh, presents you the word of God in its fullness. That is actually closer to the, to present it in its fullness. That means that before Paul, the word of God had not been presented in its fullness. You know, so that when he said fulfill, the real Greek word means to complete the word of God. That means it wasn't completed. To preach it fully, that means it has not been preached fully. This is a very significant text in scripture. So, let's go through all the other verses again, uh, uh, versions again. God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. That's NIV. So, that means you've not had it in its fullness, even if you have had it. The next, uh, uh, next version to make the word of God fully known. To make the word of God so people can know. Oh! See, it's not like to make everybody get to know the word of God, but the fully, the strength is on the fully. That means it's been partially known. So God has called him. What I'm saying is so important. If you get that key, it will help your understanding of a lot of things. It's, what I'm saying is so fundamental. But a lot of people don't know this. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of Christians, a lot of preachers don't have a clue about this, I'm saying. To make the word of God fully known, give me a different, a different translation quickly. Um, the dispensation of giving to me to fulfill, that's King James, yeah, to fulfill the word of God, yes, the previous list not been fulfilled. I want to get it full. So that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word. 
You see, the, the strength is there. You see the fool, fully. Fool. And if you are not careful, you think that so he can do it without restriction. No. It really means so he can get, make it full. The, so that's where the strength is. The strength of the text is actually, that's why it says, so, so I might fulfill the word of God. Now, go back. How do you fulfill the word of God? That means that like Jesus came to, there's a prophecy, I fulfill it. But if that's what he means, then the other translations, like well, the one we read before, that does not make justice to the Father like you're fulfilling a prophecy. Right? Do you understand what I'm saying? So that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. So if to, uh, to a prophecy and to make it full, that's not preaching. So this one is a, to a preaching. So the strength of, uh, do you get what I'm trying to say? The, the, the text, what is buried in the text is the, King James is the word to fulfill it. Now it's full. I've made the word of God. So after you meet Paul, you can't say you don't understand what God has been doing. But before Paul, there's still a lot that was gaps. Things were left. That is why it was Paul who said in Romans, I've been teaching about this for the past three weeks. So, who said in Rome, Mr. Rion, who said in Romans chapter 16, verse 25, that the mystery of the gospel, it says that now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel, that this thing I've been preaching, Paul said, my gospel, say my gospel. My gospel, my gospel and the preaching of, the, of Jesus Christ according to the revealing, revelation means something that has been covered for so long, it's been covered for so long and unveiling it. So according to the revelation of the mystery, kept secret since the world began. So there, oh, you know the revelation I'm talking about? Genesis chapter 2 verse 24, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be cleaved to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. He says that it's just a mystery. Hey. Wow. Jesus comes, he calls it, but he didn't fulfill it. Now, Paul said, I am the one. God has given me the mandate because there was no way Jesus could have fulfilled it. Do you know why? Because Jesus Christ's earthly ministry was under the Old Testament. Oh, the New Testament has not been enacted. His earthly ministry. So whatever Jesus did, the Bible says, Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, when the time, fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born after under the law. So Jesus was still under the law. That is why he died according to the law. Because according to the law, there's no remission of sin without blood. According to the law, he died. Cursed is anyone who dies on the cross. Because he was, an, Jesus, oh, come on, listen. Romans chapter 8, verse 3. What the law could not do, God did. God did what the law could not do because it was weak through the flesh. God did by sending his son in the, in the likeness of sinful flesh. And died, he came to do the law. That's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. He said, don't think, just 17, don't think that I came to destroy the law and the prophet. You don't think that I came to destroy the law and the prophet. You don't, I didn't come. Uh, look at verse 18. He said, of verse 17, sorry. He said, I came to fulfill it. I can, see, that, this fulfilling is different from what Paul was talking about. That, fulfill the, that word fulfill is different from this word. I bet you if you look at the Greek word, you see two different Greek words. Jesus came to it has been spoken and he came to live it out. Paul didn't come to live the word of God out. He came to complete, he came to teach it and make it the revelation of the secret that has been hidden. Something has been hidden in God. And so you can read the Bible and read the Bible and read the Bible and read the Bible like a Muslim. And you are just so blind, you'll be talking rubbish that is contradicting itself because you don't just understand it. You need a pastor, let me to fulfill the word of God for you. Hallelujah. You need a preacher. You need a teacher. So he said that this, uh, he, he came to fulfill it. Jesus Christ lived under the law. He died under the law. And he fulfilled, <laughs> Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. And when he finished fulfilling every requirement of the law, for the punishment of sin and everything. He gave himself to be the sacrifice, a, a, a scapegoat. The scapegoat didn't sin. It was the people who sinned. But the scapegoat was, they became the victim of something that he had not done. That's, why, that's where we get a word scapegoat from. It's from Leviticus. 
And so Jesus Christ came to be our scapegoat. He came to be our ransom. Bible said he came to give his life as a ransom for many. For many. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. He came to give his life as a ransom. When I talk about Jesus, I get get too excited to preach about Jesus. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. Was a ransom. He had to die a death that didn't belong to him. That's why the thief knew. Even the thief who was accusing him said, if you are a son, why don't you save yourself? Because you are a son, you you shouldn't be here. The other one said, no, but why are you saying? Because he's not supposed to be here. Paul, Paul just said, no, he's not, that's, that guy is not supposed to die. The people who crucified him knew that they have done something criminal. Yeah. Bible said that Jesus Christ, the, uh, John, um, uh, um, Acts chapter 2, verse, verse 22, whom through, uh, attested by God with signs and, law, uh, signs and miracles, verse 23 says that, who through you have crucified through lawless hands. Yes. His crucifixion was lawless. Mm. Sit down. What does it mean to be lawless? It, it was it's miscarriage of justice. Because he was, in, why does, why do you punish somebody who is innocent? Why? What grounds would you punish the person? On what grounds? They didn't have any grounds. There wasn't any legitimate grounds. There wasn't any legal grounds for his execution. So he said, you through lawless hands have crucified. They crucified him. So he was sinless. He was innocent. So what, what are you doing on the cross? He came to obey the Father. Why should Jesus die on the cross? That's what I'm talking about. Why should he die on the cross? Pontius Pilate in John chapter 18, he said, chapter chapter 19 verse 4, chapter 19 verse 6, chapter 18 towards the end, he said, what has he done? I I find no, I, I, I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him. Even the criminal said, but this one has not done anything wrong. Luke chapter 23, verse 43. He said, shut up, why are you talking like that? We are, we are, we are worthy of suffering what we are, we are suffering. But this man, he said, but this man, 20, verse 21, but this man has done nothing wrong. He knew, the other guy knew. He was telling him, we are, we are worthy of, but you and I know that this guy is not supposed to be here. Even the criminals knew that he was, he was wrongly accused. But, so why should that happen? Because God, God wanted it like that. that. That's why he told God, if it's possible, let this not come, let it come. But nevertheless, as I, as you, not as I will, but as, Matthew chapter 26, verse 36, but as you will, so let your will be done. That's, what, what, that's why he went to the cross. So it seems to suggest that Jesus dying on the cross was God's plan. Wow. Yeah. God wanted him there. God, there's the songwriter said, till on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was settled. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he said, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Ah! Hallelujah. He, he, God made him. He knew no sin. He was sinless. He was faultless. He knew no sin. God made him to be sin. So that when he was there, wow. that's our sins on the cross. Yes. So sit down in John chapter, chapter 19, verse 30. When he hung on the cross, he finished paying all the demands of the law. And he said, Tetelestai, it is finished. It is. That is when the New Testament was enacted. Wow. Because you can't enact a covenant without shedding of blood. So, so before he went to the cross, the night he was betrayed, 20, uh, Matthew 26, from verse 24, 25, 10, he took the communion and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. Ah, my good God, my good God. So I said, for this is my blood, my blood, my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many, for what? For the remission of sins. The blood of Jesus is for the removal of sins. That is where the good news starts. That's where the good news starts. The good news starts because the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. He pardons you. But why would God forgive you? You know, God, you can't forgive Hitler. He has come into Christ. And Christ has paid the, the, the price for the sins. 
Everybody. That's why it doesn't matter who you used to be. It doesn't matter. Nobody can go before God and accuse you when you are in Christ. Wow. In fact, Romans chapter, in Romans chapter 8, verse 34, he says that who is the one who accuses? If someone should accuse, it should be Christ. Yes. But he rather, he doesn't condemn all. Is it Christ who died? And furthermore, is, is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God? Who makes intercession for us? Yes. <laughs> The one who has the right to be able to accuse us is actually in inter- oh. Shout hallelujah! Shout hallelujah! He's, he's interceding for us. He's interceding for us. He's interceding for that fornicator. Because according to the law of God, whoever is caught should be stoned. According to the law of God, you are supposed to be condemned before the presence of God. But Jesus said, Father, no. I've taken the condemnation. I've paid the price. Let him live. So all the demands, oh, all the holy demands, all the righteous demands, all the pure and just, just demands of God, which was given by the law of Moses. The law of Moses came from God through Moses. In John chapter 1, verse 16, it said, the law was given through Moses. That means this is just, it didn't come from Moses. It was just given through Moses. It was given through Moses. Who gave it? God! But God didn't only have law. He also had truth and grace. <laughs> the law was given. So he took the law and he gave it to Moses. So Jesus Christ, watch this, he came to live under the law so he can fulfill the righteous, the just demands of God on humanity. But human beings, how can God ask you a question for you to be able to answer? (laughs) How can God place a demand on you and say, I can meet it? Like the Israelites told God, told, told Moses, tell God, to speak to us and whatever he says we will do. Hey! They meant it. They, they were genuine. But they didn't know what they were coming to ask for. And God brought his laws to the extent that even if an animal gets near the mountain, the animal will die. Hey! What is this now? Please, please! Stop. We don't want God to come near us. He will kill us all! He will kill us all! Can you imagine? Then all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. They said we will do it. But they realized that you can't meet the demands of God. No human being can meet the demands of God. The law of God was weak through the flesh. So he says, I want to do it, but my flesh, something is living in me, something is living in me. All right. So Jesus Christ came and fulfilled all Oh, he said, I came to fulfill the law of the, and the prophet. And then met it. And then enacted, introduced a new covenant. Because according to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 16, it says that you can't have a covenant without death. Or a testament without death. He said, for where there is a testator, there, watch, I like, I like the phraseology, they're so sweet. There must also of a necessity. If a young lady comes to tell you I am pregnant, that means of a necessity someone has visited her. <laughs> it's not like I, she ate mangoes and now she's pregnant. No. It doesn't happen. They say you have to tell us what, where you went to. Who is behind this thing? You have to tell us. <laughs> who? 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 The man behind this. Yeah. Have to tell, they, you have to tell us. All right. So where there is where there is a testament, there must also offer necessity. Do you know what a testament is? Testament, give us NIV. Where in, in the case of a will, that's it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it. Uh-huh. Okay. And that 
than that, the will is not valid. It's not enforceable. A will is only enforceable upon the death of the one who made the will. He's called a testator. A testament is only valid upon, uh, upon the death of a testator. Look at the next, the next verse. For a testament is in force after men are dead. Since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Okay. NIV, because a will is, is enforced only when someone dies, somebody dies. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. New Living Translation. Now we can add those guys. <laughs> the will goes into effect only after the person's death. While the person who made it is still alive, the will cannot be put into effect. So, testament is a will. Now, Jesus Christ is the mediator and the enactor of the New Testament. So, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 28, he said, he took the cup. Uh, I think we have communion today. Yes, wow. He took the cup and he said, this is my blood in the new will. So, that means that whilst he was alive, the will has not been enforced. And so then, the hidden things of God, which has been hidden from Genesis, cannot be unveiled above, except in the church age, except in the New Testament age. And so Jesus himself could not unveil it, because the New Testament will only be enforced after he dies. Oh. Are, you, are you getting it? So... When he died and he said, it is finished. And he gave us the ghost. Bible says that there was darkness on the face of the earth for, for three hours. The sun went on break. Yeah. The sun went on. There was thick darkness. Thick darkness. The sun went on break. For three hours. For three hours, the sun went on break and there was earthquake. Wow. And tombs opened. Wow. And people who were dead, some of them, they were walking in town. They were walking in town. Yeah. They were walking in town because something of cosmic weight and cosmic significance has happened. There has been a change on the death. Why? We are transitioning from an old covenant into a new covenant. If I were you, I would shout my Lord and hallelujah. That's why there was darkness. There was a switch. And Jesus died. And then when he died, now all the demands of the justice of God have been met in full fulfilled. He fulfilled, that's when he fulfilled the everything about the law. He's been met in full. When he was living, he was fulfilling it. He never broke one. He was fulfilling it. But when he died, he fulfilled it actually on those of us in him, our behalf. He fulfilled everything. He said, it is finished. That means that now, the New Testament can come. So before he died, because they took communion while he was still alive. And then when he gave them the wine, it wasn't his actual blood. Because he hasn't shared, he said, this is my blood which will be given for you. Yeah, he said, this is my blood which is shared for you. So the blood had not been shed yet. He hadn't been arrested. From here he went to pray. And then when he went to pray, that, they came to arrest him. Judas brought the people to come and arrest him in the garden. So he hadn't died yet. So he said the night, in fact, Paul puts it first Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, that Christ Jesus, the night, verse 24, so the night he was betrayed. You see that? He took bread. And after he had given thanks, the night, verse 24, the night he was when did he take the bread? The night he was betrayed. So he hadn't been betrayed yet. When he had given thanks, he broke it, said, It, this is my body, which is given uh, for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup quickly. And then in the same manner, he took the cup. This is the cup 
Uh, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. So it wasn't an ordinary blood. Ah, that's why God allowed him to die. Because it was a covenant that was about to be birthed. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. In Jeremiah, God said, I'll make a covenant, a new covenant between me and my people. Oh. And now, it's more a, a solid marriage, marriage covenant that was about to be made. Because God wanted union with his people. But how can God be one with his people when they are in sin? Wow. So a covenant had to be a, a, enacted. And so Jesus took, the, that's why we take communion. He took the communion and he said, this is the blood. This is the, the new covenant, the blood. Uh, the, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remissions of sins. Wow. Every time we take communion, we are reinforcing it. Yeah. Yeah. He said, this, this covenant, this, this cup is the new cup. So there was new covenant in his blood. Why shouldn't he die? Did, Peter thought he was playing a good man. Oh, Jesus, you can't die. No, you can't. Jesus said, hey! He saw Satan talking. Satan is working now. Because Satan is trying to block God's agenda. Wow. He's going to, he's going to, he was concerned about natural course of events. It's painful. You know, it's not good for someone to die. It's not good. Oh, this is not nice. It's not human rights. It's not, shut up! Shush. Satan, get up! You are not thinking about the things of God. You're only thinking about what is nice for people. That's what Jesus told Peter. The Bible said he turned to Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. He turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. He looked at Peter and said, Satan. It wasn't Peter, but there's a Satan at work. Because Satan never cares about the work of God. He cares about how people feel. Why are you leaving the choir because of the way you feel? Satan is behind it. Why are you leaving a church because the pastor said, don't go out with that girlfriend? Satan is like, well, it's not nice. It's not nice. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not nice. He's the, I mean, I don't want to sin, but she helps me to be sinning. And, and you know, I just, he said, but the way pastor said I should what, should. what else should they say? Come on. Should they say, I'll book Uber for you guys to go? I'll, I'll book holidays for you? Yes. You see, Satan only takes advantage of what you care about. What you care about or you may call human rights or social justice. Well, so Jesus Christ died to enact the covenant. So that means that before he died, we were not in the new covenant age, New Testament age. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not new covenants. They are not under the new covenant. They were under, it was a transition period, but they were still in the mosaic territory. Because Jesus was still alive. It was when he died. It's because a testament is only in force after the death of the testator. Before Jesus died, everything before that one is Old Testament. So, that's why Jesus Christ quoted from Matthew, but he didn't fulfill the word of God. He fulfilled the prophecies, but he didn't complete the word of God. He couldn't complete the building of the church. Jesus can start it by his death, but he, would, he wasn't the one to complete it. He wasn't there because he died to start the church. Now we have to come and complete it. Because he's no more physical human being. And the church is meant to be built by physical human beings. Like you and I who have been doing outreach. And have been serving in church. So, Paul then talks about in Colossians chapter 1 verse 24 again. Oh, yeah, 24 again. He says that, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you. And fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. For the sake of his body. Which is the church. I'm feeling it in my body. I'm building the church and I'm suffering, but I'm doing it. The, and it says, what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ? So the sufferings of Christ, some is not finished. He couldn't finish it all. Because it takes sufferings to, to build, raise the foundation of the church. That's the death. And it also takes suffering to build the church. 
So the first one, the first suffering, no human being can do it. That's Christ himself. It's called redemption. So he came to suffer. So can start the church building program. But now, the rest of it is left for you and I. So when Paul was suffering, he said, I'm happy to fulfill my part. Then he goes on to say that, verse 25, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship of God, which was given to me, now I've come back to where I, I jumped off, uh, to me, for you, to fulfill the word of God. Now, this is very important. So Paul said he had an assignment to make the word of God full. Things that were hidden in the Old Testament. Ephesians chapter, I'm going off again. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God given to me for you, how, that, how I've written about it, if you read my previous uh, verse 3, something like that. I've heard the mystery by which if you read, you understand, you, you, you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. Go to the next verse. Which in other ages was not made known to men. Now Paul said, I know things that men didn't know. Now that's what he's saying. He said, now if you, if you listen to what I'm preaching, Paul said, if you listen to what I'm preaching, the things I've written, you will have an understanding of this mystery. Mystery is something that no one, a, a mind doesn't have. He said, the mystery of Christ, which was, uh, which, uh, which has, uh, as it has been, okay, uh, uh, it says that, was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy prophets and apostles. Now look at the next verse. It's getting very interesting. What's the mystery? That the Gentiles be fellow heirs of the same body, partakers of the promise of Christ through the gospel. Look, look at the next verse. Of which me, this mystery thing, I became a minister according to the grace of God which was given to me by the effectual working of his power, eight and nine, which have, to me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace is given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Look at the verse nine. That's where we are going. Verse nine. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of their mystery, which from the beginning of the ages, Adam, when God made Adam and Eve, when God was saying that it was not good for man to be alone, there was a mystery behind that one. Ah! It has been hid from the beginning of the ages, which has been hid from the beginning of the, uh, from the beginning, has been hid in God, who created all things through Christ. So now what he's saying is that something that has been hid from the beginning, now I have been given the authorization. Because Christ has died and resurrected, now I'm going to make it known to men. That's my assignment. That's what he says. So that means that we have to listen to what Paul says very critically to understand what God has always planned from the beginning. Because what God has planned has been unfolding in bits. But throughout the ages, all the unfolding of the, of the plan of God has let something essential out of it. And it was never revealed. Christ couldn't even reveal it. But Christ knew about it. I mean, he's the, he's the planner. He came to fulfill it. He knew about it. That's why when Peter said he can't die, he said, hey, let me have me Satan. He knew it. He knew it. That's why he couldn't stop the death. Pontius Pilate wanted to stop his execution. He said, hey, you don't have what it takes to stop it. Go ahead. Do your job. That's why you are employed. Do your job. <laughs> <laughs> and then he told his disciples, now no one takes my life from me. I lay it down and pick it up. No one can kill me. And yet the apostles said, you through the lawless hands have killed. So on one hand, it looks like they killed Jesus. But Jesus is saying the truth is that I actually laid my life down. Why? I did it willingly because we, we, have to, we have to enact a new testament. We have to enact a new covenant. That's why he came to die. And then now when the new testament is enacted, those of us who are in the new testament have the privilege of beginning to... Bible, in fact, the Bible says that um, Colossians 1.27, but God was pleased. He pleased God. He's willing. The, uh, God... That to them, talking about the saints, okay, that them, they look at verse 26 just to make sense. Is someone getting something? Yes. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and, oh, the mystery. What is this? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. 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 The mystery, watch this. So the mystery which has been hidden. You know, I told, we saw it's been hidden, God, already from Genesis, uh, from uh, the beginning. The mystery which has been hid, hidden from Ages from generations, including Moses, Isaiah, David, Jeremiah, all of them. That's why when this David said, I want to build God a house, God said, David, I've, I've, I've concealed this thing. How do you manage to 
talk about it. David! David! You can never preach a complete New Testament message without making reference to David. Uh, David! He has to be hid from ages. But now, say but now. It always was not remain hidden. After the resurrection, things changed. So he said, but now has been revealed to his saints. Saints are not dead people, please. Saints are not dead. Saints are people who are sanctified in Christ. The definition of saints, the Bible tells us the definition of saints. Those people who sometimes are confused when they talk about saints, Anthony and all those people. Show them. The definition of saints, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. We read it recently, verse 2. Paul called to be an apostle through the will of God and sustenance our brother. Look at verse 2. To the church of God at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ. Jesus. God. Who are saints? Those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. When you are sanctified in Christ Jesus, you are called to be saints. Saints, sanctified. Saint Spirit. Saints, saints, it's holy. Sanctified, to be set apart. So anyone who is a Christian has been set apart for God. So when you're a Christian, you don't belong to your boyfriend anymore. You belong to, oh, come on. God is saying, you are me, you are mine. You don't belong to your girlfriend, it's you are mine, you are mine. So those of you who claim to be a Christian, you still belong to some people. So sanctified, now watch this. So he said, but now has been revealed to his saints. Another word for his saints, his people. Another word for his people, the Christians. Things that no man knew. Colossians chapter um, 1 verse 26 again. It says that the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generation, but now has been revealed to his saints, his saints. To them, who are the them? The saints, he just mentioned. So to the church, to us, God willed. God, it was the choice of God. God willed, he planned it. I think, give me a different translation. To to them, God has chosen to make known amongst the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. So the things that have been hidden, God has now chosen that the saints, I'm going to let them know. But it doesn't happen because you are sleeping and you see a revelation. It must be taught. So Paul was the one giving the primary commission to now complete what the ages have been needed to teach it and unveil it. So what did he do? In Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, verse 24, when he says, now a man shall live, therefore a man shall live, his father and mother shall... Two shall become one flesh. And Jesus also comes to make reference to it. That Jesus said, hey, I came to fill the Lord. Don't forget that. That's the beginning. Jesus actually quotes that in the beginning. He said, God made them. Je- Matthew chapter 19, verse, I think verse, verse, from verse 4. And he answered and said, when they asked him a question about marriage when divorce, his answer was, uh, have you not read that he who, he who made them at the beginning made them Male and female. So male and fe- That's not mine. The point is that he took them to the beginning. They came and asked a question about marriage. He took them to the beginning. So marriage was the first thing that ever happened in the beginning. First thing that happened in the beginning. And then they are coming to discuss marriage with Jesus. He said, I can't unveil it because it can only be unveiled in the New Testament. But let me just point you to the beginning. That's how it has been in the beginning. So Jesus, then Jesus quoted Genesis because it, it quoted what scripture? A man shall leave his verse six, a man shall leave his father and mother. That's when he quoted it. But he was pointing them to the beginning. I told you something, that because God's eternal plan was marriage, anybody who tries to temper with marriage is tempering with the picture of God to his, his people. Wow. 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 So Sodom and Gomorrah, God judged Sodom and Gomorrah because when you check it, they messed up the system of marriage. And then in the days of Noah, Jesus quotes in Matthew chapter, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, Luke chapter 17, verse 25 down was there. He said in the, in the days of Noah, 
The air was surprised, though. No, as it was in the days of Noah, so only being the son of man. What, what, what was it about the days of Noah? Look at the next verse. They ate and drank married wives and were given. What has marriage got to do? Is there anything wrong with marriage? Why must the, a reference to the judgment of God on humanity, it has something. There was a marriage somewhere. When God decided to wipe the whole people out and judge them, first time Sodom and Gomorrah, because they tempered with marriage. And then when it comes to Noah's time, Noah's time too, they, there was something about, but the Bible was not very clear about it, but for Jesus to refer, they were marrying and giving to marriage. There's something about marriage, because when you read it very carefully, you, the Bible said sin was so bad. So God said, no, 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 you can't temper with marriage. He took them and wiped them off. And then he started again. And anytime anybody tempered, so Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, he said, Marriage is honorable in all. What? Oh, look at this. Marriage is honorable in all, and the, and the marriage bed is not defiled. If a husband and wife are coming together in sexual union, God said, That's good, guys. That's good. That's good. That's fine. Because that's what marriage is about. Then he says that, that that's actually, it's supposed to be within marriage. Then he said, But fornicators, and adulterers, go, 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 judge, go. So, no, I didn't say it. The scripture said, fornicators and adulterers, go to judge. It's scary. God values marriage. Why? That's the eternal question. Why? Because he created us, because when he was creating us, he had marriage in his mind. Oh, not your marriage. No. He's talking about his marriage. That's why in the Old Testament, he kept keeping the, the imagery of God as a husband to his people. His people being a wife. He kept it. He never lost it. He kept it in the Old Testament. It's not just a New Testament thing. It's an eternal program. So he kept it in the eyes of his people. Marriage. Me, God, I'm marrying you. Me, God, I'm marrying you. I, I saw you the scriptures. Then Jesus comes on the scene and he says that, John the Baptist says that, ah, the, the bridegroom the, the bride must go to the groom. And the, me, the friend of the groom, John chapter 3 from verse 28, 29, the, the friend of the groom, I'm happy that today I'm seeing the bride go to the groom. Ah, so he's calling Jesus a groom. Then Jesus dies. Then Paul, why did that bring Paul in? Because he was the one who, the third person who quoted what God said in Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, that a man shall leave his mother and father. But look at the context within which he quoted it. He said, husbands, love your wives. And why? As Christ loved the church. Verse 25, Ephesians chapter 6. As Christ loved the church and gave it. So if you are not careful, see the way it starts from verse 22. Wives, submit to your husbands. Wives, submit to your husbands. As unto the Lord. Look at it. Let's go. For the husband is the head of the wife. As, oh? Christ is the head of the church. And he's the savior of the body. Oh, 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 oh. See, there's something about marriage amongst us that is looking up to the marriage between Christ and the church. So he says, I want to help you with your marriage, but the only exact replica or exact image I can give you is Christ and the church. Now look at the next verse, verse 24. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives, oh, so the church is like a wife? Okay. Oh, okay. Let wives be subject to their husbands and everything. Then it goes on to the husbands. Say, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Ah, what, are, you talking, are you talking about Christ and the church or are you talking about husband and wife? He said, wait, wait, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for the church. Then he started talking about Christ and the church. Look at verse 26. That he might sanctify, is he sanctify? Saints. He might sanctify her and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. Verse 20, 27. That he might, Christ might present her to himself a glorious church. He actually sanctifying the church to present the church to himself. What? what? Not having spot of wrinkle. That, is, this, is it not connoting wedding dress? Yeah. Not having spot nor wrinkle, not having spot nor wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. The next verse. So, oh, now he's finished talking about Christ. Okay, husband, now I've, show, I've shown you the exact example of the purity of marriage. Husband, try. None of us can get to that standard, but at least we have a model. Yes. A model to follow. So he said, husband, 
So husbands ought to love their wives, their own wives, as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. He's telling up something. Jesus loved the church because he loves himself. He loves the church. If you touch the church, he will touch you. Look at the next verse, verse 28. We are going somewhere. For no one hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does. The... What is happening? It's like you feel like telling, can you leave God out of this? It's just between me and my girl. It's between me, me and my man, my, my husband, my wife. Leave God. He said, no. God instituted this thing because of himself. It's because, not because of your children. I didn't know that he wouldn't be allowing children to be born when people are not married. So he doesn't take marriage to have children. But he takes marriage to reflect Christ and the church. And then, <laughs> the next verse, the next verse. For we are members of his body and of his, in fact, the verse before, let me add something there, verse 29, says, no one ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes, just as Christ. Listen, Christ is cherishing the flesh of the church. When I say flesh, he's cherishing the church. Yeah. So when you serve the church, guess who you are doing a favor to? It's like Christ. As, the more you serve, the more he begins to look at you. Some of you, God is, Christ is looking at you from heaven with a smile. So you, you, are, you are treating my body like this. You are nourishing my bride like this. You are making my bride, anything. Some of you spend so much on your body, but not on his body. Now watch this. Verse 30, verse 30. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bone. The next verse. For this reason, oh, Paul. He goes to what happened in Genesis. For this reason. For this reason. For this reason, a man shall leave his father. This is quoting from Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Yes, quoting from what Jesus also quoted it. Now Paul is going back now. Watch this. Because of the New Testament age. Now, this can be explained. It has been hidden, but now Paul has been given to me. Hallelujah. To unfold it, to complete the word of God. Paul came to complete this whole picture that started from Genesis. Now, so what's the picture? Shall leave his mother and father, a father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And he said, This is a great mystery. But I speak on. Oh, oh so what, it was, what was said in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 was actually a great mystery which was pointing to Christ in the church. What Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, verse, 20, 20, uh, verse 6, was actually a mystery that was pointing to Christ in the church. So if you stay there in Genesis, you stay in uh, Matthew, you won't get it. You have to come to Paul, who has been given the commission to complete, you see now what I'm talking about. He has been given the commission to complete the word of God after the death of Jesus Christ. So now, this thing that has been hidden in God now can be explained. What's the explanation? The church is like a bride to Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. Let's all say that together. The church is the bride of Christ. Are you, are you learning something? You know the word of God is so sweet. The word is sweet. Hallelujah! What? I love God's word. David said, it is sweeter to my taste. It's sweeter than the honeycomb. He said, how, how I, oh, how I love, how love I, your Lord. It is my meditation all day. Ah, I love God's word. The word of God is sweet. If it is unveiled. And when it's not unveiled, you will just be asking questions and questions and questions and questions. So, In Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 and 2 and verse 9, look at what it says. Now I saw the new heaven and the new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth has passed away. Climate change, everything has passed away. Also, there was no more sea. That's good news. Sea is a reflection of something evil. In Genesis chapter 1, if you remember, God's Commanded, the Bible said the darkness covered the deep and there was only water. And God drove the water into one side and brought the land and he called the water the sea. 
God and man. So what has always been Genesis? That's why when the demons were cast from the pig, they went into the sea. So a sea, the sea in the Bible has not been a good image. That's why the Red Sea was trying to block the children of Israel from going to their place. God had to divide the Red Sea so they can walk through and bury Pharaoh and his foolish people in the Red Sea. So he said, but the new heaven and the new earth, there's no sea. But that's not why I brought you here. Look at the verse 2. I like the verse 2. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared. Hmm? What did I just see? Hey, hey, a surprise. Wow. The holy city prepared as a bride out of heaven. As a bride adorned for her husband. This is when everything is ending. The end of the ages. There's a wedding about to happen. Oh. But you know what surprised me? is the verse 9. Guys, one of the seven angels who had, who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plague came to me and talked to me saying come and I will show you the bride the lamb's wife <laughs> that, that's Genesis, this is revelations chapter 21 mom there is no devil no satan in revelation chapter 21 and 22. There is no Satan mentioned in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. Wow. Satan, first two chapters of the Bible, Satan was not there. Last two chapters of the Bible, Satan was not there. Listen, the rest of it, Satan has filled everywhere. So if you actually want to know God's program and plan, look at the first two and look at the last two. Join them. And the first two, the chapter two in Genesis, that's where the marriage happened. Now, the last but one chapter in the Bible, he said, come and I will show you the, the bride, the, the lamb's, the, the bride, the lamb's wife. So he said, a bride, he was a bride, she was a bride first. And she became a wife. Who is the lamb? If you don't know who the lamb is in the Bible, that's a big problem we have to understand. Who is the lamb? John chapter 1 verse 29. John the Baptist saw Jesus come and said, Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In Revelation chapter 5 verse 4, I wept. I wept, and then one of the, so I wept much, and one, uh, because there was no one found worthy on the whole earth to take the, the book and break the scroll and break the seals and read it. So I wept, but one of the elders, one of the elders said to me, do not weep, oh, uh, do not weep, because be, uh, behold, the lamb of the tribe of Judah, the root of, the, uh, uh, I like David, I like David, I like David, I like David. You can't fulfill the New Testament without mentioning David. The root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to lose it. So I'm thinking, wow, hey, somebody has done it. Somebody has solved the uh, cosmic problem, the cosmic, the biggest problem of humanity. Someone has solved it. Wow. So I tend to see who this, 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 this lion of tribe of Judah is. When I turned, I saw in the midst, I saw a lamb, the lamb of God, which was cut and he was bleeding. He was bleeding. Watch this. Look at the next verse. verse, verse. So I saw the lamb, verse 7. Then came forth and took the scroll and he opened it. As soon as he, let's go. He opened those who sat on the, on the throne. And now from the whole house, when he had taken the scroll, the 420, the elders, they fell before him, the, before the lamb, having half a golden, a golden bowls full of incense, which were the prayers of the saints. The next verse, and they sang a new song. You are worthy, worthy is the lamb to open the seal, for you were slain. Who was slain? Do you know what it means to be slain? To be crucified. His death was so pivotal in the changing of everything. That's why it could not be stopped. For you were slain. Watch this. And because you were slain, you, and you have redeemed us to God by, by your blood. I 
out of every tribe, every tongue, every people, every nation. It, 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 it crosses boundaries. It crosses cultures. You have redeemed us. And they were singing to the Lamb. After he came, and this is not before redemption. This is a scene in heaven after redemption. Because he has come to die already. And the Lamb was slain. He was slain. So when we talk about the Lamb, you are talking about Christ who was slain. Now, he has a wife. So he said, come and I will show you the, 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 the bride. He said, come and I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Are you ready for this? Yes. This one, you might not get it fully, but let me let the Bible talk and then one day we'll explain it. Okay, look at the next verse. And he carried me in the spirit into a great mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem. Descending out. You remember when you saw verse 2? It was descending like a bride. Oh, so the bride is a city. It started in a garden. And the, the Bible started with a garden. Now it's a city. So in the middle of the garden, it's, what is, it's a house. The house of God. As the house of God is growing, the, the church is the only building that grows. Yes, sir. Oh, have you seen, ever seen building that grows before? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, 21, 22. Is the church, is a building. We have, we have made it, us into a holy temple, having been built on the foundations of the, uh, verse 21. In whom, verse 21, verse 21. In whom the whole, verse 21. In whom the whole, uh, uh, the, the whole the building fitted together grows into a holy temple. Now, this building is growing, growing, growing. By the time everything is ending, it's a city. Wow. And the building is not an edifice. That's why no human being could build it. You remember dwelling place? Yes, sir. No human being could. The building is the people. It's us. As a, not you. Not me. Not him. Not her. But us. That we are the building of. In, the, in fact, today I read it because yesterday I was so busy. I didn't get to read um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So today when I was going to read my Bible, I started 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And verse 9, I bumped, verse 9, I bumped into something. I said, oh, oh. He said, you are God's husbandry. You are God's building. You are God's, <laughs> you are God's building. So now we are the building of God. And this building is growing, is growing. By the time Revelation comes, everything is ending. I see the building descending from God like a bride. And oh my goodness, and it's a city. Wow. Wow. So it looks like God's plan has always been to have a bride for his lamb. You remember first Adam? You remember last Adam? The first Adam has his Eve, and then the last Adam has his church. And Paul, Paul kept talking about it. Paul kept, he said, I'm, I'm meant, I'm called to fulfill the word of God. Yes. Paul kept talking about it. And now, the last Adam, who is the, the lamb, in Revelation, is going to end between, in a marriage supper. Mm -hmm. So that is why he says that, blessed are they who are invited to the marriage yeah. of the lamb. Mm -hmm. The marriage supper. Yeah. Matthew chapter 20, Matthew chapter 26, verse 29. Look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 29. But I say to you, I will not, this is when he was going to drink the communion. <laughs> he said, I will not drink the fruit of the wine until the day I drink it anew in my father's kingdom. So he knows that what is the day he's talking about when we are coming back for. And as I told you, because marriage is so important for Jesus, for God, that's why the first miracle Jesus did had to be at a wedding because, because marriage was our marriage is important to God. Now, God created us for companionship or as a counterpart. Not in heaven, because remember, I saw the new Jerusalem descending from the new heaven. Yeah. On the earth, coming to the new earth. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. So then, heaven has not got any problem. It's when God created the earth, he created us to be his reflection. He created us to be his um, enlargement. He created us to be his habitation. He created us to be his counterpart. Then chapter three of Genesis, Satan came in to mess everything. 
But in chapter 20 of Revelation, Satan was booted out. Yeah. Yeah, that's when he left the scene. Chapter 20, verse, verse 9. The, the old serpent, the dragon, was cast out. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and the brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are. And they will be tormented day and night forever. That's the end of the devil. Yeah. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, was the end of the devil. So now the last 21, chapter 21 and chapter 22, there was no devil. That's when the marriage, oh. <laughs> Amen. God bless you for listening to this powerful message. May the power of God be evident in your life. Don't forget to like and subscribe to Carriage Church on YouTube and listen to more messages from David Entry on all relevant streaming platforms. You can also connect with David Entry and our youth ministry at Caris Phase 2 on Instagram and TikTok and at Caris on Campus on Snapchat so you are always up to date. Be blessed.